to the church. Well, you know, we're celebrating Father's Day today, and that's not a time for men to come to church and get beat up about all the negative things about Father, as perhaps that was done in years past. Now, we're supposed to always proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. So whether whatever day we're celebrating in our culture, we stay true to the word of God, and that's what we're going to do today. Let us pray and go into our lesson. Father, we thank you for these opportunities that we get to focus in on that area of our human existence whereby we can look through the lens of the word of God, the scriptures, and have faith understanding of what you have already revealed concerning your heart, concerning your will, concerning your purpose and plan for mankind and earth. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will anoint us afresh with the Holy Ghost and power that we may rightly divide the word of truth and that that word will go up on good ground, Father, that it will be a ground that will bring forth a fruit that will bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last Father's Day, I ministered a message about 
the heart of the Father. And what I did was I did a uh, comparison between the Father in heaven and the earthly Father in those cases in the Bible whereby God would make statements like this, even as a father. What he was talking about, even as an earthly father. And so I went through those particular things and I began to show us that this is the these are the characteristics that should be coming forth from an earthly father. Now God always exalted himself way beyond the human father because the human father, like all of us, have flaws, has a fallen nature, but thank God that he's a righteous and he's a good father. And we're going to be ministering that this evening uh, at 8.15 on the uh, radio broadcast station. So I want to encourage you, 8.15, 96.1, we'll be ministering that message uh, this evening. But today, I want to focus on this area. I want to focus on trusting the Father. And that's what I want to talk about, trusting the Father. There's a scripture that perhaps most of us are familiar with that has been said in our church settings uh, 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 at times. And it goes something like this. Even if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will lift me up. Another translation renders that even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. You see, God fulfills the role in each of our lives as the one who provides total protection. He's not like some of these warranties and things that we sign and pay money for and all of a sudden in the time of trouble when we got a problem, we try to use it and all of a sudden they tell us, well, you know, it's some fine print, you got to pay this before we do this and then they'll tell you, well, this is not covered and so people end up, they take in those plans and they end up returning them. Well, God doesn't give us a plan like that. God gives a plan where he's faithful and true. Well, when we deal with Father's Day, uh, there are seasons in which a child or children may experience the total protection of a father. Yes, when a child is born, the father who's there and going to be responsible, they play a certain role, but they provide total protection for that child as much as they can. However, there are things that happen along the way that causes that protection to change. For instance, there's what I call the natural course, there's chosen courses, and there's consequential courses that may provide a limited or either no protection at all. For example, it's normal for a child to develop and a parent, and I'm talking about a father here, a father knows that they have to begin to make adjustments in how they relate to that child. So it won't seem as though in their quest to protect them, they end up trying to control their life. So it's what we call normal developmental phases. And then their life choices. There are times that children will begin to make choices that their father and their mother can warn them. And because of those choices, there is a limited amount of protection. And then it's what I call the consequences from unwise and worn choices. Sometimes you can warn a child and all of a sudden, because of the consequences of those poor choices, then all of a sudden that protection is limited. And I share that because that's how it goes with a natural father. But today I want to go higher. I want to go higher and I want to focus on our heavenly father. And I want to put that particular verse that we've often heard into context. So let's go to Psalms 27. We're going to glean from there today because David makes this statement that when my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. You know, we can look at it different light. Could be David saying that part of his uh, experience have been the abandonment of his parents. Or perhaps he's making reference to the fact that as he grew older and as things went on and his father and mother is no longer there on the earth. So they are no longer there to give him protection. But he said, here is this. The Lord will never abandon me and the Lord will keep me close. Well, what was it that caused David to have such a confidence in the trust and trust in the Lord like this? I believe as we look in this psalm, the one thing that I see, well, the first thing that I see is this, is that David depended on the Lord with limited light. In Psalms 27 verse 1, the scripture says, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, the Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? 
The Lord protects me from danger, so why should I tremble? Another translation said, the Lord is my light in my salvation. So when we look at this particular verse, a lot of time we may begin to look through the lens of scripture in our present day with our present technology. And so when we look with the present technology that we have and it come to light, we can begin to think that David had this bright light that he was making reference to. Well, there were two kinds of lights. First of all, it was the light of creation. The light of creation goes like this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. At the beginning of creation, God himself, the author of light, spoke light into existence. He didn't concern himself with the darkness because the darkness had to give way to the light. And also remember when the children of Israel, they were going through the wilderness, they had a pillar of cloud uh, by night, uh, by day, and a pillar of fire by night. What's that? That's light. And also we notice that when David speaks in the Psalms, I think we see here a better picture of how this light works because it's like David is looking through the lens of what we would call uh, perhaps when the power go out. This is a good example. When the power go out, a lot of times we have a candle. We'll light the candle, but the light that the candle gives is very limited. It only covers the space that one is in. It doesn't cover the other parts of the house. I'm just using that to kind of give us an idea. The light that David was familiar with was only a little light, a little light in a lamp. And so we see in scriptures, I want you to see some scriptures. That Deut Deuteronomy 31 and 8 says this. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Listen, listen. God goes before us. So even though David know that his light is limited, he can trust the fact that even in the darkness of hay, ahead of him, God is already there. Listen, listen. The favor of God surrounds us. God protects us in the... Uh, uh, from where uh, in, uh, in our future and God delivers us from the bondages of our past. I want us to grab this now because when David begins to say the Lord is my light and my salvation he could only relate to a limited amount of light but he trusted God for his future and when we walk with God, God does not give us the whole plan. God does not tell us what tomorrow will be. He tells us don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Because God is already in our tomorrow. And then in Psalms 119, 105, the psalmist say, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. See, when we have the word of God, get this, we may not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. We have the word of God. And so as we take the word of God, that word is like a light. And the more we trust God, day by day, God provides direction for our life. And then in Proverbs 4.18, the scripture says, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Notice, the path of the just, the righteous. Glory to God. God doesn't tell us our future. God doesn't tell us how the situation is going to work out. God doesn't tell us how long we got to wait. But he said that if we wait on him, we need to be of good courage. And so I want us to grab this now because David is looking at life as though God himself is his light. Hallelujah. In other words, there is no limit to God. The light that we are familiar with, the light that David was familiar with, could only shine around him. It was like a lamp around his feet. But he trusted God for what was ahead. And if we're going to trust God, we got to trust him for what we can't see. We got to trust him for what we don't know. But we got to trust him knowing who we know. And we know the Lord is my light and my salvation. Therefore, I will not fear. The Lord is the light of my life. 
Hallelujah. I'm not going to be afraid. And so David learned how to depend on limited life. You and I, we got to depend on the revelation that God gives us. We have the word of God. We stand on that word. That's our life. But we have to walk by faith day by day. We have to trust God when we can't see the answer. But we know who has the answer. So we got to depend on the Lord with limited life. I know we want God sometime to lay it all out for us. Then it doesn't require faith. The Bible says the just shall walk by faith, shall live by faith. This is a faith walk. We serve a faith God. A God who wants people to trust what he has said. Well, this longing of David's heart is uh, also revealed, not only in the fact that he depended on God in limited life, but he desired the presence of the Lord. If you notice in the psalm here, David's heart is revealed in what he chooses to focus on even when his enemies have launched their evil attack and assault against his life. If you look at verse 2, it says, when evil people come to destroy me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds my heart, will have no fear, for even if they attack me, I remain confident. How, how could David, in the midst of all that's going on around him, focus on God? It was because no matter what was going on, no matter what the enemy was doing, their attack, their words, that was not his focus. He said, my focus is on one thing. And that one thing is that I may dwell in the tabernacle of the Lord. What's that? The presence of the Lord. What, what, what one thing are you desiring and focusing on because that becomes where your faith will be targeted. If you're focusing on what the enemy is doing, your faith is off the target. And so here the psalmist said, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid of my enemies. I'm not walking in fear because this is what my confidence is. It's in the one thing. Saints, we got to place our confidence in the one thing and that is the presence of God because you can be in a storm but if the presence of God is in that storm that's going to affect your attitude in your actions I want us to consider those one things those one things because Martha she had to get settled in her spirit because Jesus tried to get her to get her focus right on the one thing so in Luke chapter 10, listen to verse 41 and 42. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken notice. One thing is necessary, Martha. God don't want us overwhelmed by the things that are going on around us. God don't want us overwhelmed by our agendas and our schedules and our responsibilities. He wants us to balance out our life so that we can say, what is the one thing that I know I need to do today? What is the one thing that I know I need to put on the first of my priority? And that is to be in the presence of the Father. Jesus had to correct this young man that was deceived by his riches. And had an attitude like he really wanted to follow the Lord. But that has to be tested. Commitment has to be tested. So often even in the church, people are easily ready to say, oh, I'm with you. Oh, I got this and I got that and all this stuff here. But once the test comes, you will find their heart. Even Peter said to Jesus, no, Jesus, I will never abandon you. I'll go and I'll die for you, Jesus. Jesus had already told Peter before uh, the rooster crowed three times, you're going to deny me. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you return, strengthen your brother. What happened? That intercessor, Jesus Christ. Who's our intercessor right now? Jesus Christ. 
When we fall, when we sin, Jesus Christ is already there making intercession for us. And all we got to do is do like Peter, repent, Lord forgive me. And I mean, oh God has already taken care of the matter because he is our intercessor. But for this rich young ruler, there was one thing that Jesus said was missing. In Luke 18, 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, this is what Jesus said to that rich young ruler. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. We know he walked away sorrowful because he couldn't get the one thing in order. And God is telling us today, we're going to have to make it a priority. If we're going to trust God, we got to desire his presence above everything and everybody else. So the psalmist is saying, this is my confidence. One thing I have asked of the Lord, a desire of the Lord, and that's what I'm going to seek after, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and delight in the Lord's perfection and meditate it in his temple. For he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Man, because he desired that one thing, he placed his confidence on the presence of the Lord to be in the house of God, to be in the presence of the assembly of the saints. Because he had his priorities right, he knew that God was going to protect him in that presence of his presence. God was going to shield him. God was going to keep the enemy from being able to touch him. God was going to lift him up, put him on a rock far above his enemies. He's in the presence of the Lord. And so trusting in the Father, David not only depended on the Lord with limited light and, and he desired the presence of the Lord, but you know what else David did? David delighted in praising the Lord. Hallelujah. If you look at verse 6, the Bible says this, Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me at his tabernacle, I will offer sacrifices and shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Glory to God. Hallelujah. David said, I'm going to depend on the Father. Yes, I'm going to depend. I'm going to desire his presence. But I'm going to delight myself in praise. Glory to God. It's time for the church to be able to celebrate the praises of God. It's time for us to stop thinking that we can scream at games, we can scream at events, but when we get to church, as old folks say, we act like a nod of the law. It is time for the redeemed ones to know that God has called us to a kingdom of praise. Oh, I want to close with some of these songs just to stir up your faith because we got to start letting the word of God direct our praise. The first song is 33 and 1. The Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord, O righteous ones. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Notice, one translation says, It is calmly for the upright. It is fitting, it is proper for the righteous to praise the Lord. If you are righteous today, if you are born again, the Bible says this is fitting for you. In other words, you are not uncomfortable with praise. You don't feel like you are out of place with praise. You don't feel like uh, you can't relate to praise. When you assemble with other people who know that praise is fitting, that praise is comely, y'all share that in common, and so nobody is looking at somebody else praising the Lord. Hallelujah. And then in Psalms 111 verse 1 says this, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Notice, I'm going to do it with a genuine heart. My heart is going to be in my praise. I'm not just going to praise him with my lips. This is coming from my heart because Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this is coming out of my heart. My mouth is only causing it to come forth in a sound that's audible, but it's coming from my heart. There's a praise down on the inside of my heart. Glory to God. And then the psalmist say, when I'm in the company of the upright in the congregation, he said, I'm going to praise the wife because they're going to be doing the same thing. 
You see, religious people, they will move with music. But when you are righteous, you are moved by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And if the music don't sound, if the musician don't show up, there is still praise in the house of God. I've seen times in churches where people would not do nothing because the musician is running late. No, no, no. It's not the music that determines our praise. It's the maker that determines our praise. And my maker is worthy of praise. Praise is fitting. Praise is calmly. And, and, and get this now. When your praise is limited to singing, you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself. Because the scripture says there's some fruit in our mouth. And when we begin to exercise the fruit of praise, it's not that we got to be singing it. We can speak it out of our mouth. And that's why I encourage worship teams. Don't think you got to hurry up and sing the next song and the next song. Take a praise break. Take a moment when you get through singing and just begin to make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Fear the atmosphere with praise. Encourage the people to join in with the melody, making a sound unto the Lord, and let the fragrance of praise come in that house. And if the fragrance of praise is in the house, everybody who walk in that place is going to tap into that odor of praise, and that aroma is going to draw them closer to the Lord. Hallelujah. That aroma is going to cause them to want to desire the things of the God of heaven because they know that your praise is not a performance. Your praise is not you trying that cute. Your praise is not so you can just show off, but your praise is genuine. Your praise is for the glory of God. Your praise is because God has been so good to you and all you want to do is give him praise. Psalms 34, 1 and 3 say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt. Notice the humble. The humble is going to hear my praise. And they're going to humble themselves before the Lord. When you're full of pride, you're not going to praise him. It takes humility to give the Lord the praise and the glory Do his name. Well, listen here. When you praise him, that praise will lead you to worship. That praise will lead you to a place where you will bow down before the maker. And so in Psalms 96 and 9, the scripture says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. What's the splendor of his holiness? It's his beauty. It, 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 it is his beauty. It's his glory. And when you praise him, and that Shekinah glory began to manifest in that place, there is this humility where people are literally being broken, where there are things that God is breaking up in our hearts, where he's breaking up the foul ground, and there's bringing a sweet fragrance of humility and submission unto the Lord God. In Psalms 96 and 6, 6 it says, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Can you imagine? People up dancing and rejoicing and shouting and giving God praise and dancing all over the place and nobody looking at nobody. Why? Because everybody understands that praise is fit and calmly for the upright. And all of a sudden there's a place in praise where all of a sudden they transition to a place of worship. That's where God begins to speak to their hearts and they bow down before their maker and they adore him and they cry out to him and he's filling their cup glory to God he's taking empty vessels and he's pouring the oil of his spirit so everybody in that congregation can be filled with the Holy Spirit that's what happened to the widow woman when she thought her life was at the end of the road and she goes to the prophet and literally says and I paraphrase my husband is dead and now the creditors are coming to take my sons I love my sons. I don't want my sons to go. They are my hope for provision. And the prophet said, what do you have in your house? And she said, a few empty vessels. He said, well, take those empty vessels and go and borrow some. In other words, humble yourself and reach out. Bring the empty vessels. She got all the empty vessels, brought them in the house. And all of a sudden, God, by his spirit, 
began to supernaturally fill those vessels with oil. And he kept filling them and he kept filling them. And all of a sudden, the oil didn't run out. The vessels ran out. In other words, the more vessels she brought, the more oil she would have had. But yet she had enough to take care of her problems and to take care of her future. And I believe that's what God does when we're in worship. We're emptying out everything that's not like God. We're repenting before God. We're confessing things before the Lord. We've been broken so that he can heal the brokenhearted. And all of a sudden he fills us with all. And we rise up no longer talking about the problem, but sharing the promise that God has brought in our life. This son is trusting the Lord. Trusting the Father. It sounds good, but it serves those who and are supplied with the power of his protection. And they are willing to depend on the Lord with limited light. They are desiring above all else the presence of the Lord and they are dis delighting themselves in praises unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Trusting the Father. Well, I have a few faith action questions I want to share with you and just give us opportunity to process this and see how it fits in our life. The first one is this. How are you responding to limited light but unlimited power? You know, Israel, they limited a unlimited God because of a lack of faith. It wasn't that God couldn't do it, it's they couldn't believe him and trust him to do it. But our God has unlimited power. But he may not give us but limited light so the just can live by faith. What is the one thing you need to find confidence in? For David, it was the presence of the Lord. It wasn't so much going to church. But he knew that in the tabernacle was the presence of God. But it was the presence of the Lord. And the last one is what's hindering your praise and how can you unleash it regardless of what's going on around you? Saints, I believe we're at a time in the church where God has taken out traditions of men to hinder the word of God. I think we're beyond that. And I believe what he's doing now, he's transitioning the church from this emotional, want to feel good, music types setting and God wants some people to know how to praise him in the beauty of holiness that even if you don't have a musician even if you don't have a singer even if you don't have the lights in the platform people can praise him in a manner that he's worthy of all the praise I believe we're getting to a time in the church this is the season I believe we're in where God is saying no flesh is going to glory in my sight and if you tickle their flesh, if you accommodate their flesh, you're going to forfeit my favor and power to come on their lives. You don't want to do that to God's people. I don't want to do that to God's people. So let's open up the gates of praise. Let's let the people know that where the spirit of the Lord is, that's not confusion. That's not people out of order. But there is a liberty to, to praise him. To praise him with your whole heart. To lift up your voices like trumpets. To shout unto God with the sound of, with the voice of victory. Hallelujah. For his, get this now, God goes up with the praise. Praise is a spiritual weapon. Praise is a weapon where the enemy goes running. Praise is a weapon where the enemy realizes that he can no longer remain attacking you in that area. Why? Because your praise is driving him out. Glory to God. I believe we get a revelation of praise. Every blood washed believer want to come to the gathering of God's people, not so we can have good church, not so we can have fun, but that we can get into a setting where people know how to praise him in the beauty of holiness, in his splendor, in his glory. They will know when his presence show up. They will know the degree of that presence. They will know when to transition from one part of the service they won't need a program. They don't need a bulletin. They don't need to say we got to hurry up. They're under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is a spirit of praise. Hallelujah. Well, I can go on and on by praise because not only do I know about it, but I experience it. Hallelujah. It's the word in operation. Hallelujah. And so David gives us a beautiful witness of what it means to trust the Father. 
Well, God bless you. I know you've been blessed by the word of God and, and you may have started shouting right there. You may have to get up and, and do a dance in the spirit. Glory to God. I'm not talking about, as folks say, a Holy Ghost dance, uh, but a dance in the spirit. The spirit of God stirring you up with the praise. When you preach on praise, when you talk about praise, it stirs up that anointing. Glory to God. All you want to do, we can go into a praise right now. We don't need a music. We don't need no sound. Right now, you and I, those those who know that it's fitting, those know that praise is fitting for the upright, that's the righteous. If you're righteous today, this is what we do. We are, uh, this ain't something we do at church. This is who we are. We are people of praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I know you've been blessed by the word of God. I want to encourage you this uh, coming uh, Saturday, Saturday coming, we're going to have our, our worship and dance uh, conference here. At the church, it, 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 it requires a registration. It's free, but it requires a registration. Go to our website and uh, register if it's still open. And uh, Minister Gail Glover, she's going to be coming in and she's going to be conducting this uh, worship uh, uh, dance. And I, she and I talk, and I really believe dance is not a performance. Dance is not something you do and people sit down and clap hands and people come around. I believe the dancers join in with the worship experience. Those who are carrying the flags, all that has to be by the anointing. Hallelujah. If they're going to play a, a horn, a sound, a chauffeur in the service, it's got to be by the anointing. You can't put that on a program. You can't say, well, today we're going to have the dancers. The dancers just going to spring up in the middle of worship. They're just going to spring up and they're going to just begin to dance in the presence of God. Nobody's going to be sitting there, you know, as the folks say, not on the law, but we're already in praise. We're not looking at them. We're looking at the Lord. We're lifting him up in praise. But that's going to be this coming Saturday. And again, you can go on the website and get information on that. I want to thank the men. We've been having our tubes in touch. And I tell you what, you're talking about man up. This is a call of God. This is nobody getting up in your face fussing at you, telling you to be a man. You're already a man. But you're going to man up. And that means that you're going to honor God and you're going to serve him grace gracefully as you look at Jesus and how he discipled those men that was with him. Hallelujah. I tell you what, when you look at those disciples, I know one of them has <laughs> got that spirit of the betrayal. That spirit is still in the church today, but you got to get them out. That's the wolf, and eventually they're going to get out, and the church needs to rejoice instead of wondering what happened. You need to say, praise the Lord. That old betrayal, that old Judah spirit is out of our church. Well, when Judas got out of the way, how do you know the church moved forward with the Holy Ghost and power and carried out the will of God, and that's what we're doing for the glory of God. Well, God bless you. Have a great day in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Thank you.